Okay, so we are going to pick up on the topic of meaning. Um, again, we're describing, I guess, the, the way of being of a person and how that opens us up to this sort of transcendental capacities, the capacity to think about the future, to entertain various possibilities, inevitabilities, to be able to escape the immediacy of the now and come back toward ourself in a way that we can have some sense of you know, what this is, this, this life that we're living. And it opens up various um, existential givens or concerns that we have to reckon with in some way. We've kind of laid some of those out as being the, uh, well, the existential given of, of death, our own finitude, reckoning with the problem of, of meaning or, or a meaninglessness and the issue of freedom and responsibility. So in the last class, we, uh, we talked about how um, you know, we, we all, I mean, as, as we mature, we, we develop our symbolic capacity for thinking, language, and so on. Like we, we have a conceptual understanding of our own mortality, um, but we rarely take that on in the first person experiential sense as, as it, uh, might bear on you know the time that we have and what we're going to do with it and so on, and there's a distressing anxiety uh, that comes along with reckoning with that problem authentically, and we settle that anxiety uh, through, well, largely through uh, what culture affords us, what culture gives us in terms of symbolic abstractions that either allow us to deny the problem altogether uh, through religious belief and an afterlife and so on that you don't actually die. Um, or through, um, for the terror management theorists, through subscribing to a cultural belief system that would give you a sense of significance that in some way allows you to transcend the limits of your own mortality, that, that you're doing something that is so meaningful or important that you're part of, of a, a whole that will transcend you know, flesh and bone and you're contributing in some meaningful way that uh, settles the issue of of uh, confronting your own mortality. And then, you know, culture also gives us various distractions and ways to avoid engaging with, with many of these issues. So for the terror management theorists, you know, culture, one of the main roles of culture is to give us ways to deny the reality of our own finitude or confronting that, that existential concern. Um, but the argument, I guess, is, is that, well, that, that doesn't quite get at the whole picture, arguably. Um, and uh, what we're going to explore here is the possibility of, of the, the issue of meaninglessness, whether life is intelligible for a human being, whether it hangs together in a way that has some coherence, a felt sense of belonging, whether we're able to you know, find some sense of, of purpose in the life that we're living, that arguably that is for many people, more important than the issue of death. I mean, many, many people, you know, quite frankly, kill themselves because they reckon that life has no meaning or purpose, right? So it can't just be about um, a fear of, of death. Um, so we're going to explore that, that other side. Now, all these, these things, in, in my estimation, they all kind of hang together and are intertwined. You know, the problem of, of death and meaning and responsibility and so on. Um, you know, it's, it's often the case that it's through confronting your own mortality, the finitude of existence that lights up, you know, the meaning systems that you're living by, right? And then you're able to, in a more authentic way, challenge them and explore them and, and so on. Um, you know, it's through our, our meaning systems, like if we ask ourselves the question, like, is, is there anything that's worth dying for, you know, um, a, a value or something of significance, a relationship, um, you know, and, and of course, if this opens up authentic possibilities that, that no one else can settle this issue for us, then we have the issue of, of freedom and a responsibility uh, in terms of, you know, what we do with, with the choices that are available to us. So this is a quote from Travis Prue. He says, while we are all motivated to eat and drink to maintain our survival, and we are all motivated to survive, 
We are the only animal motivated to forgo survival if our meaning impulse isn't satisfied. More to the point, we'll deliberately end our life if we believe that our life has no meaning. There are, apparently, fates worse than death, such as feeling alienated from a world that makes no sense. This is a quote from Peterson and Flanders. Our essential existential problem can thus be more accurately conceptualized as vulnerability to complexity with subjugation to death appearing as a non-trivial but far from identical consequence of this more basic vulnerability. Um, you know, for whatever it's worth, you know, in, in the bit debate between, um, such that, that you can notice that there is a debate to be had between like the terror management theorists and, and someone like Jordan Peterson, I think Jordan Peterson um, overstates in many cases, like the, uh, the case for, for meaning and, and maybe doesn't give the terror management theorists its proper due. Um, but that said, I, I do think that there are blind spots with terror management theory that they're not properly accounting for the issue of meaning. Um, there's a quote by Viktor Frankl. The prisoner of Auschwitz in the first phase of shock did not fear death. Even the gas chambers lost their horrors for him after the first few days. After all, they spared him the act of committing suicide. So we can think of this in, in a couple different ways. Frankl, remember, was a psychiatrist who, uh, who survived Nazi Germany. He was a, a prisoner himself. He was a prisoner at Auschwitz. Um, I think the, uh, it was one in, in 28 prisoners uh, survived, right? So it was the, the odds of coming out of that were, uh, were pretty grim. Um, and he saw some absolutely horrific things, and of course, uh, there's, you know, the, the suffering, that, that there's a certain amount of suffering that is arguably unbearable, uh, where death itself becomes, you know, a, a preferred option. So, of course, people were, were starving to death. They were tortured. They were, you know, marched for kilometers to, you know, engage in, um, you know, working and in these horrible conditions, often without shoes and, and in their bare feet in the cold of winter. Uh, Typhus was, was rampant, infection, diseases, uh, there was no medication, they are given rations of like just watery soup, they are lucky if they got a couple peas in their soup, um, and one little small ration of bread, so you imagine this sort of life uh, dragging on. Um, and what was um, interesting in, in um, so uh, Frankel had written a book about this, uh, Man's Search for Meaning, half the book is, is looking at some of these experiences from inside the concentration camps and, and he was curious about what allowed a person to endure um, through all, all of that hardship and, and this sort of vacuum of, of meaning and in a way he, he argues that you know we have to have some way of or the people that were more likely to survive they weren't the most physically hardy individuals they were the individuals that were able to uh, I guess offer some justification for their suffering or that there's some meaning that was able to structure their life that would allow them to, to keep moving forward. And the people that lost that in some way because they got word that their family had, had died and, and there was no one to come back to, um, you know, they, many of them lost that sense of meaning. For Frankel, it was, you know, in, in part, you know, the hope that he was going to reconnect with his wife. He never did. Most of his family had died. Uh, but, but part of it was this idea of, of wanting to, to write this book. So he had this idea of, of uh, you know, something that he wanted to create, that he wanted to bring into the world, and he would have like little scraps of, of just jot notes that he would hold on to, and that would be like a uh, you know, dear treasure that he would not want to, to lose. He lost it at least once um, and had to kind of rewrite from scratch. But, so again, this question of meaning is, is, uh, is very important. Camus states there is but one truly serious philosophical problem, and that is suicide. Judging whether life is or is not worth living amounts to answering the fundamental question of philosophy. Is life worth living? Is it, um, is it worth in enduring many of the hardships that we have to endure? Or, you know, is, does it, is it just pointless? Is it meaningless? Uh, do we just, is, is suicide a justifiable option for us? So this is one of the questions that, that he was uh, uh, wanting to engage. So the, the kind of being that we are as, as, 
as Dasein, the self-interpreting being, or um, the being whose, whose way of being is an issue for itself, we have this longing for, for meaning, for the world to have some sense, for it to, to be intelligible, for it to hang together in a way that has some coherence, and you know, that will offer a solid ground or a footing from which we can structure our lives, that we can um, ascertain some sense of purpose, that our life is for something, um, that it matters in the end. So we have these, these existential longings in, uh, in, in being the, in the way that we are. And yet the world, you know, independent of, of human beings, such as we can imagine it, uh, has no answers for us. There is no, you know, there's no solid footing, there's no absolute ground, there's no concrete doctrine uh, that is infallible, that will give us the structure that, that we long for, um, that will allow us to make sense of, of the lives that, that we're living. One way of putting it is, uh, is a quote by Camus, if I were a tree among trees, a cat among animals, this life would have meaning, or rather this problem would not arise for I should belong to this world to which I am now opposed by my whole consciousness and my whole insistence upon familiarity. This ridiculous reason is what sets me in opposition to all creation. So what he's saying is, is that, you know, we, we stick out from the world in a way, you know. We, we, we have that ability to, I guess, to transcend or to... to become desituated from the world in a way or uprooted from the world that, you know, again, even in, in our possibilities, we are able to contemplate the, the not, you know. Um, and so from an evolutionary perspective, we can imagine, again, it, it was just more or less like a, a material efficient causal process for, for a very long time. And then with consciousness, there was like this sentience, this ability to, to experience, to sense, and, and then self-aware consciousness eventually came, came into play. And where we have this ability to turn back on our situation and, and say, well, what, what the hell is all this for? What does it mean? Why should it matter? You know, what is the purpose of this life? What, what, what is the purpose of my life? And again, it, it creates a, or has the potential to create a great deal of anxiety. This is Heidegger quoting Novalis. Philosophy is really homesickness and urge to be at home everywhere. He goes on to say, to be at home everywhere means to be at once and at all times within the whole. We name this within the whole and its character of wholeness, the world. So it's a longing to, to be at one with the world, to, to feel settled. To, to not feel this sense of, of uprootedness, you know? And again, when we, f when we experience that, that, um, that, that destabilizing uprootedness, not only do we experience a kind of existential anxiety, but, but also a, a feeling of uncanniness, uh, this, this being not at home in the world. Uh, there's a really interesting book if you're into this Heideggerian stuff, it's by Catherine Withy uh, on being uncanny. And she makes the argument that, that human beings are themselves uncanny in the way that we are, that we, there's, there's always something about us that can never be fully at home in the world. Um, and that's a kind of anxiety that, uh, that we have to contend with in some way. It's a very difficult book, by the way. It's, I, might even say it's, it's more difficult than being in time, you know, which is actually saying something. Um, so I haven't fully uh, digested that, uh, that book, but it's worth picking up if you're, if you're interested. So the way that, um, that Camus would put it, it it's kind of like a formula, and this, this is maybe just worth knowing for, for the test. The idea is that it's, if, if you think of it in terms of formula, that we are meaning-seeking creatures, we are thrown into a world that we find ourselves in a world that, that if, if our eyes are open, you know, again, the, the world has nothing to offer us in terms of an absolute doctrine. You know, the world is, is silent. It, it, uh, it does not satisfy those, those questions, those longings that we have. And so 
we're asking of something from the world, the world cannot give it to us. You know, we, we create the relative meanings and whatnot. Uh, but this dilemma is, uh, you know, leads to what, uh, what Camus describes as, as the absurd. Now, there's, uh, there's a great deal of overlap, and uh, they might even be speaking to different parts of the same phenomenon uh, with existential angst or, you know, the, the, the uncanniness or the absurdity of uh, human existence. Um, so, and there's lots of different works that kind of explore like the different facets, but uh, if you get the general concept, I think that's the, the main thing that we're trying to do here. So, just to summarize, we want the world to offer us an unshakable certainty in terms of in, in a coherent intelligibility, a ground from which we can derive personal meaning, significance, yet the world as it is is unable to do so. We find transcendence, we you know, move beyond this, this issue or this problem through the symbolic, through our symbolic action systems, and we turn this emptiness into pregnant symbols, symbols that are pregnant with, with the very meanings that we're longing to have uh, satisfied. We live as if they offered us a steadfast truth or infallible ground. We set aside our rationality and fall into a comfortable forgetting, or rather the existential questions that might be asked never arise. So we are absorbed into that comfortable, average, everyday way of being. We look around and see what other people do, and, and we do some variation of, of that. We are owned by the one or the they, uh, in Heidegger's jargon, das Mann. Again, we are primarily inauthentic in our average everyday way of being. Authenticity in terms of like an actual choice, um, you know, choosing one's possibilities is like a, a small kind of momentary achievement before you, you find yourself again absorbed into that comfortable everyday uh, mode, this sort of fallen mode of, of Dasein. Now, if one is, is lucid at just the right moment, of course, you, know, you can notice or catch, or perhaps even sort of feel the absurd in its true form, along with the symbols that attempt to transcend it, or the action systems that attempt to transcend it, or avoid the problem altogether. Um, and you know, there's, there's no telling sometimes like when this, this will kind of show up. So again, much of the time we are in this sort of uh, a drunken, tranquilized, zombified state of existence. Um, we're going about our business and doing what one does and we're assuming the ground uh, that gives us a sense of direction or meaning or something like that. But every once in a while we can be thrown out of it and we can see our situation uh, more clearly, although it, it, that can be a very distressing experience. Um, I remember for me, I was, I was in my early 20s and I was here in Halifax and I was walking from a friend's house and it was really late at night, it was like one o'clock in the morning or something like that. And uh, the street was just absolutely empty for the most part and it was quiet and as I turned a corner, I, I heard this faint sound and it was just this pulsating sound and I looked across the street and there was a bar there, right, and the bar had you know, this, this window where you could look in and there was just all these people dancing, but you couldn't hear the music, right? Which is a really eerie thing, um, especially just, I mean, just regular dancing, but drunk people dancing especially, right? Is, is really odd or eerie. And I just remember standing on the other side of the street, just watching, just sort of, um, I don't know, like in, in a trance, just in this weird, you know, kind of circus show of, of human life um, and I just had this sort of transcendental kind of moment, like, well, what, what the hell is this? What, you know, what are these beings? It, they almost failed to be human beings in that moment. It was a very uh, odd sort of experience. Um, many of you may, may have something similar to that when, you know, you're in a coffee shop or something, you're trying to get some work done, and you're drifting away from, from your work, and, you know, you look across the coffee shop, 
and you know, it's late at night, it's kind of dark, the lights are on and stuff, and, and there's someone over there in a seat and they're sitting by themselves and you're looking at this person, you're people watching for a moment. And you see this person, they're on their phone, right? And they're just you know, texting away, texting away, and they just have this sort of flat blank look and you can see the reflection, the glow of the screen off their face. And you're just fascinated, just kind of looking at this person. And every once in a while you see a twitch in their face, like a, a smile or something as they're reacting to whatever dumb thing they're, they're doing with their phone or they're texting or something. And you have this thought, why is this person alive? What, what are they for? You know? And, uh, and you see this person as being absorbed in some, some futile, I don't know, meaningless kind of existence or something like that. And, and you kind of, again, like you, you see this, this absurd kind of circus show that, that we all partake in. Now that may sound like quite judgmental, and, and it is, right? But, but what's really interesting is recognizing that there are times and moments when people look at us and see the exact same thing, right? And so there's a kind of humility in recognizing like, well, I'm, I'm part of this circus show. I'm part of, you know, at times I get lost in this mode of being and, um, and uh, lose myself arguably, right? In something that, that perhaps doesn't really have meaning or doesn't, doesn't matter all that much. Um, Yeah. Any, any questions about any of that? We have a little bit of, I think, um, flexibility with the time in the next couple lectures, which I'm, I'm happy to have. Uh, but it also means that, you know, if you guys have, I want you guys to get something out of these lectures. I hope that, that they're helpful to you. But if you have questions or things that, like, that you, is like really burning on your mind that you want to ask, by all means, ask them. Uh, sometimes a professor is kind of like a pinata, like you got to keep poking to kind of get some of the good stuff to come out, or you realize that, oh, there's no candy in there after all. Um, but, uh, but I would ask you to, uh, to do that if you feel inclined to, especially if you feel like you have like some, some sense of, of what we're up to and, and what, what we're doing here. Um, that may help some of the other students. Um, I don't know if, if there's a, an easy answer to that. I, I, I you know, maybe a, a person is, like, what was my state of mind, I guess, like, you know, like, well, I wasn't thinking about, like, oh, the laundry I got to get done tomorrow because I have to, you know, have that stuff ready for work. There has to be, like, a, I guess, a, like, a, maybe a, a loose connection to some of that uh, ready-to-hand sort of in-order-to stuff. Um, and, and maybe like a readiness, I, I guess, to, uh, to be momentarily thrown out of, of that. Like in your example, you just kind of follow a robot? Yeah. Um, there's, like, there's, there's no one to kind of disrupt. Like, there's no one that is kind of, um, ha there's a possibility of encountering or something. Like, I mean, it's, if you're walking down a busy street, what a street is normally busy, I mean, it's weird walking by, it's just outside a bar and there's not a single person on the street. So that's kind of weird on its own. It's sort of eerie. And, and then there's all this activity going on, but it's going on, you know, behind this glass pane, you know. So it highlights, I guess, the, yourself as an observer rather than a, a participant, you know. So maybe that's that's part of it too. Yeah. So um, so we have this this sort of absurd dilemma or, or situation or way of finding ourselves. And what Camus observes is is that we rather than, than, you know, kind of hold on to that tension. That, that's the theme here, by the way, right? Is, you know, to, to try to live a life that is most authentic, we have to find ways to carry some of that tension, that existential anxiety, to not flee from it um, too, too quickly. Um, but what Camus points out is, is that much of the time, that's exactly what we do. We, we, we flee from this problem or this anxiety. Um, and in his uh, terminology, we abandon our rationality and we, we make what is essentially a religious type leap of sorts. So that might involve, uh, you know, a straightforward leap into uh, religion, right? Um, now, again, there's, there's, we keep in mind this authentic versus inauthentic. So again, you can, if you were to take up religion as a metaphor, right, 
that it offers a, a guide that will allow you to, I guess, interpret your existential situation in a way that reveals something to you and, and gives you a way to kind of carry this existential anxiety in, in a noble way. Well, that's a good thing, but I think more often than not, what happens is we get swallowed up in some strict doctrine, you know? And, uh, and you know, a rigid template, it becomes, you know, the, the ideologically calcified in a way. And, uh, and so we believe in this system as an absolute ground that sort of spares us the existential anxiety that we would otherwise have to contend with. We can fall into various uh, ideologies or larger belief systems, uh, you know, consumer capitalism, um, you know, the, the uh, conspicuous consumption that, um, that becomes, uh, you know, an end in and of itself. Um, Marxism or, or communism had, had turned into, you know, a corrupt doctrine that became more important uh, in, in Camus' terms than the people it wanted to save. And so it justified uh, bloody revolutions and, and murder and, and so on to try to realize this utopia. And just various absolutes, whenever something becomes you know, rigidified as an absolute doctrine, um, then it becomes you know, perhaps dangerous. So that just even this absolute notion of you know, uh, you know, maybe scientific progress or an absolute justice that, that would not attend properly to you know, various freedoms that, uh, that, we, that we have, uh, the idea that ends will justify the means and so on. So what's interesting is, is uh, for Camus, um, he says that, that a lucid individual, an individual who is, is truly engaged with their situation and are confronting the meaninglessness of existence, they settle that issue through an act of rebellion. So in a world devoid of meaning, that, that the true rebel for Camus will press into the world and, and create something or uphold some certain values through their actions. Um, and they will join with, with other people in this way to create some sense of, of unity uh, with, with humanity. And this is a, a good thing and a noble thing. But what he notices is that all of these rebellious movements throughout history have, have often fallen into corruption, that they become calcified, that they become um, like this, this rigid uh, doctrine that is, uh, that is an end in, a, in and of itself. So the book where, where he kind of lays all this out is, is again, The Rebel. Uh, this is uh, an excellent book. I think it's very, very relevant right now. And so what he says is, is that the, the genuine, authentic rebel in, you know, in fighting for some, some relative justice in, in the world and trying to you know, create a balance in the world and create a sense of, of unity and, and belonging and so on, the rebel will ultimately turn against the the rebellion, because as soon as it starts to become corrupt, as soon as it starts to um, become calcified, one has to turn against it, um, or else it becomes its own bloody, you know, revolution, perhaps, right? Um, so he says uh, somewhere that the, that the rebel refuses to be humiliated, uh, but, but does not, you know, seek to humiliate others either, that, that there's this tightrope that the genuine, authentic rebel must walk. Um, and I think we see this sort of corruption all over the place. You know, we, we see it all the time. Um, I, think, I think the issue is, is that um, when, we, when we become, I guess in Peterson's uh, terms, uh, ideologically possessed, right, that, that we are owned by an ideology or something, we are in this fallen mode, you know, and, and we fail to see, like, the, the relative uh, utility of, of these ideological systems, and we fail to understand like, where, they, um, where they betray the, the initial impulse that started them, right? And so like, I, I think for many people, third wave feminism is kind of like that, you know, that it, it, th there is a, a need for, 
for, you know, for justice, for women to be treated equally, uh, for there to be equal opportunities and so on. But uh, there's a certain brand of feminism that, you know, again, it's, it's sort of betrayed that initial impulse in, in that, you know, there's, I guess, uh, uh, a contempt toward men, you know, a, a lack of, of understanding that sort of joint, I guess, uh, existence or something, you know, so. So we have to be arguably on guard for, um, I guess, being comfortably swallowed up in some form of ideology, right? Because the temptation, that's the issue, is the temptation is, is just so great, you know? Um, so it's worth asking yourself, like, okay, what, you know, what bullshit am I getting pulled into here? You know, what, what ideology has a bit of a grip on me that is constraining my ability to see the situation clearly? You know, is there a way in which I'm getting comfortably absorbed into some overly simplistic uh, meaning structure, you know, that, that takes itself too seriously and betrays the initial impulse that, that was uh, quite reasonable? Yeah. So ultimately, the book mm -hmm. was walking that tightrope between yes. those two. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And realizing, again, like there's, there's no such thing as like a, a perfectly actualized human being or a person who is always authentic or something like that, right? That's just an impossibility, I think. Yeah. Um, other comments or questions? So this succumbing to um, like the, the comforting confines of an ideology is... Uh, is again, it's, it's going back to that existential formula. It's denying one half of that formula, right? That all the, the world does have an absolute meaning and, and here it is, right? But for Camus, that would mean forgetting precisely what I mean not to forget. It's also a denial of one of the conditions of the absurd, which is itself escaping or denying the problem. So what he doesn't want to forget is he, he doesn't want to forget the necessity of, of sort of walking that existential tightrope, you know, um, or, or what, in his mind, his lucid reasoning had disclosed in the first place, not wanting to cover that over or hide from it. So what, what about, uh, you know, an, another path that you might take? What about uh, a nihilism? If there's no absolute meaning, well, then everything seems to be a matter of relativity. It's just a matter of perspective, perhaps, you know, that maybe there's no meaning at all, right? Uh, does that mean that we succumb to despair? Does, does it, you know, justify suicide? For Camus, suicide is, logically speaking, again, escaping the problem. It's escaping, you know, uh, well, the, the, uh, the existential formula, the meaning-seeking creature. We just eliminate that and, and problem solved. Again, that's that's an unwillingness to kind of maintain that, that tension in our way of being. So escaping the absurd involves clinging to an absolute hope, which is an illusion. An absolute hope is some absolute doctrine, you know, that will give us an infallible ground or structure, you know, from which we can derive some sense of significance or something in, in some, you know, a concrete way. So it involves clinging to absolute hope or absolute despair. For Camus, the absurd both binds and it liberates. So it binds us to its terms. If, if we are able to, you know, sometimes like, you know, have our eyes wide open that, that we can see the situation for what it is, it binds us to its terms. Now, in what way do, is it liberating? If you've been kind of paying attention, you might have some sense of that. How does it liberate in, in reckoning with the absurd or, or encountering it in some way? It means like you get to pick and choose your meaning system? Well, well arguably not, not infinitely, but there's a, a relative, you know, choice that's involved, you know, that, that we can get some distance from our tranquilized state, you know, that if we encounter some of this anxiety that would free us up in a way to reckoning with the problem of death and the problem of, of meaning and the, the ultimate meaninglessness in a sense that, uh, that makes up much of our day-to-day our -day life, 
then if we can hang, hang out here and encounter the world as, as world in a way as much as possible, then it all opens up some choice, some, some genuine possibilities. Um, but it's very, very hard to, uh, to know whether those choices are, are, are genuine, like that, whether they're truly authentic, right? I mean, they're, they're certainly more authentic insofar as there's an agent, you know, that, that is, I don't know, reckoning with, with some part of reality in, in, uh, in uh, a more courageous way, I guess. But, uh, but we may fool ourselves in a sense, you know? I mean, that, that's what happens, I think, when people like, well, well of course communism is, is you know, the, the right way to go because, you know, uh, it's, it's the most moral philosophy and, and uh, that we could take up and so on. And, but they get lost in this sort of thing. Heidegger himself, um, you know, we haven't talked about this, but I mean, it's worth mentioning that, that Heidegger was, was affiliated with uh, the Nazis, right? Like he was um, a member of the Nazi party, actually, you know? Um, so, um, I mean, that's a whole, and we could talk for a half an hour about what that means and, and what, what that does to his philosophy, if, if anything. I think some people have, have said that, well, you know, he succumbed to the exact same stuff that he's describing, you know, and so in a way he, he couldn't live the philosophy that he was uh, preaching in a way, which is not uncommon, by the way, you know. There are very few philosophers that can live up to their philosophy, you know. Um, so we can use Heidegger's philosophy and, and sort of turn it against him in a way. I mean, he subsequently had said uh, that it was the greatest stupidity of his life. Um, but I, I think what's most troubling is that there were various opportunities for him to actually s say more than that. And, uh, and he'd been more or less silent on, on that. Yeah, I think, I think that, uh, that sounds about right. Um, so we... we Again, we, we just, so it binds in the sense that, like, it binds us to its, its terms. Like, if you are a lucid individual, if you are self-aware, if you've given any thought as to why you should live, if you've, you know, even toyed with or flirted with the idea of suicide, right? Like, you've probably thought about, like, whether life has, has meaning or purpose or value. Um, it binds you to, to the, the terms that, that, again, that existential formula for Camus, that, that we are a meaning-seeking creature, but, but again, the... The world independent of humans, like, is, uh, or even if we take seriously, well, whatever meaning is there, it was created by people, you know, and so it, it is arguably fallible. It is arguably, it has a limited uh, context or, or, you know, where it can be applied and so on. And, and so to really take that on, it binds you to this sort of existential, um, uh, you know, kind of issue that you have to carry in some way. But it's liberating because it's, it's that, that very reckoning. The same thing with death, right? It's that very reckoning that frees us up enough that, that we can kind of see the situation more clearly. Um, sort of on a, on a related note, uh, maybe kind of focusing on some of the uncanny stuff, finding ourselves, um, so feeling or being uncanny involves finding ourselves not at home in the world or desituated from it. The world now shows up as, as perhaps unfamiliar or strange. Um, you know, sometimes we may have these, these moments. Um, so we lose our ground in the world. We lose our footing in a sense. There's a kind of existential breakdown of, of our familiar average everyday way of, of navigating the world. So it occurs, I think we talked about this, but it occurs in, in moments of worldly breakdown, the structure of in order to's that we are abiding by, uh, for the sake of witches and familiarity, fall away. And this is, you know, similar to um, in, uh, in clinical context, we, we call dissociation, right? Um, or kind of derealization, you know, where, where the world again becomes foreign and unfamiliar. We don't feel at home in the world. So we feel strangers to the world that we had once known. And for the first time, we come face to face with the world as a whole. So in a less severe case, again, we experience this existential angst, we experience this sort of, uh, this not being at home, not being absorbed in that comfortable familiarity, and now we get that distance that we can see sort of the world in its worldhood 
in its you know, totality of involvements and references and, and so on. And, uh, and we're able to maybe in that moment make, make an, a more authentic kind of choice. So for me, it's almost like you know, the, uh, our, our normal way of, of being is just that we, get, we take ourselves so seriously, most of us anyway, some people not seriously enough, and that's a big problem that we should maybe talk about if we have time. Um, but uh, we get caught up in all these kind of day-to-day -day distractions and things like that. And, um, and, but from time to time, if we're able to have, um, you know, kind of one of these moments, these lucid moments, it's like we peek our heads above the clouds, so to speak, and we kind of see what we're doing. And we can even turn the lens back on ourselves and have a good humorous laugh at ourselves, like how ridiculous I am in this weird way that I'm taking myself so seriously. Or I think that this thing uh, is as important as, as I think it is. It doesn't mean it's not important. It just means that, that maybe I need to qualify that a little bit. And in that moment of lucidity, it's like you, you kind of orient yourself. You have an existential compass of sorts. You orient yourself in, in a different direction, and then you get swallowed up into, again, maybe a different way of, of being caught up in, in some of this stuff. Um, and I think a, a human life is, is just doing, doing that, you know, like as, as best as you can. So the feeling of angst or uncanniness reveals the fact that we normally feel at home in the world. It discloses the fundamental structure of our being uncanny, at least that's what uh, Catherine Withy would, would claim. At the same time, it uncovers our thrownness in the world as a whole. You know, these, these meanings that we didn't choose, these interpretations that are not ours, that we just take up unthinkingly. And again, it makes radical choice possible, the call to become who we are. Um, so that you can consider that, you know, what does it mean to become who, who we are? Like, well, it th I think it means, in a sense, like trying to understand yourself in the deepest way possible. You know, we're talking, I think, uh, at one point about the, the hero's journey, right? And, and that call to adventure. Well, part of that adventure is, is delving into your own unconscious and delving into you know, feelings and parts of your experience that has remained buried or, or hidden. And, um, and the idea is that you're, you're rescuing a part of yourself. You know, you're, you're trying to reconnect with a part of yourself that has remained um, buried or concealed or covered over. And part of what it means to become who we are is, is to become our possibilities. Again, Dasein is that being that must take a stand on its being, its way of being. And so we are open in terms of, or in a relative sense, uh, in terms of possibilities that we might actualize and, and potentialities that we might develop within ourselves. So, so to, to recognize that and really feel the weightiness of, of that too. And we'll kind of uh, get into that more with the, uh, the freedom and responsibility bit. So again, a conscious mind has contemplated suicide as a starting point, not, not as an end. So if, if you are you know, really kind of thinking about your situation in, in the world and what it's all about and what it's for and, and so on, you, you have again flirted with that, that notion. Um, choosing to live means that you've given some thought as to why you should. You know? I think that's a, a really empowering way. I, I, I've certainly seen people use this to, to really good effect in the clinical work that, that I do. You know, that life is, uh, life is a choice. You know, it doesn't really occur to many people, but that it's true. I mean, you could end it at any time, you know. Um, and to some people, that's, that's a very empowering kind of thought. Like, I'm choosing to live rather than assuming that I should, right, rather than just taking up, you know, some whatever easy interpretation is available. Like, I've, I've given this some, some thought. I've really reckoned with my situation in a way. You know, and each day is, is like a choice, you know? Uh, there's a famous aphorism by, by Nietzsche. He who has a why to live can bear almost any how. What are you trying to do? What are you trying to accomplish? Um, what stand are you taking on on your way of existing in this world. Um, if you have something that gives you a sense of, of meaning or, or purpose, 
then, uh, then that can sustain you. That can allow you to endure a, a hell of a lot, you know? And that's, that's one of the points that, uh, that Frankel had made, right? That you can even find meaning in, uh, in your own suffering. Um, now, there are different ways of, of, I guess, trying to move away from uh, that, that comfortable absorption and get, getting caught up or taking oneself too seriously or, or the, uh, that fallen motive of being. There's an interesting little clip here that I'm going to show you guys from uh, the movie I Heart Huckabees. Has anyone seen that? It's, again, it's, it's uh, one of these films that has like all these sort of existential themes in it. And um, they're kind of toying with this sort of... Uh, meditative type technique that allows them to experience what they call pure being, uh, that allows them to get thrown out of momentarily this, uh, this fallen mode of, of existing. Um, and it's just a, a funny little clip I, I thought I'd show here. Did you get it? Yeah. I did, I felt it. It's hard to describe. Very, very good. Your turn. Now. Not so hard. Sorry. Now. 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 Did you get it? Yeah, you stopped thinking. Yes, it's fantastic. It's like I'm here, but I'm not. So I'm not here. It's, it's just, I, I, don't, I don't know. Do it one more time. It's like I'm a rock or a dish of mold. I'm whatever else is around, so I'm free to just exist. This is the answer. We yeah. just have to be this all day, every day. It's the answer. Yeah. <laughs> do it again, do it again. Now! <laughs> Careful, my young students. You cannot stay in this state all day. Why not? Yeah, why not? It is inevitable that you are drawn back into human drama, desire, and suffering. Everything that exists in this imperfect world. Shit. So we get drawn back into human drama and how important we think that is. Then we do crazy stuff. We have to go back to the ball so we can get the freedom of being like a, like a dish of mold. Yes, and then back to the drama, the suffering. It's kind of a crappy deal. C'est exactement ça. An absurd theatrical we must play out back and forth from pure being to human suffering. But isn't the drama and suffering less if we do the ball thing every day? Don't call it the ball thing. Call it pure being. Well, doesn't the pure being ball thing make the day-to-day -day suffering easier? Yeah. No, it doesn't. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure we, we know lots of people that do this sort of thing, yeah? Um, sort of like a meditative kind of an attempt to connect with pure being, not allowing our thoughts to kind of dictate kind of what's happening and, and to be connected with lived experience uh, devoid of, of thought or allowing thought to do its thing and, and whatnot. Um, and so what they're saying is, is that, you know, this is perhaps a way to escape that, that human drama, that getting caught up in or absorbed in that everyday kind of uh, mess of interactions and, and taking ourselves too seriously and, and, uh, and all the problems that go along with that. Um, but the point is that, you, you, again, you couldn't stay in this state you know, uh, for very long. I wonder if, you know, are, are there other maybe kind of issues or, or things that you might be curious about with doing this sort of thing? Yeah, well, it, yeah, it could be, you know, kind of overutilized as, as a sort of escape. Well, it, it doesn't it also encourage a kind of indifference in a way or potentially, you know, like if, if you're engaging with pure being, whatever that is, um, uh, you know, you're, you're maybe, there's, there's no I, there's no ego, there's, there's no, you know, um, sense in, in which the world shows up as having some, uh, I don't know, like some pull for you or, or that there's a sense of urgency or anything like that as it bears on your life. 
Yeah, well, I think you can use it in a way where, um, again, like it, it pulls you away from, it's like hitting a reset switch perhaps, you know, uh, it, it pulls you away from that, that you know, the, the everyday kind of uh, issues that, that we get entangled in. But again, I, I think there is a way in which it, it can be used as a kind of escape or avoidance. Um, I don't know if I told you guys this, uh, this bit, but there's a, a guy that I was working with around uh, anger and uh, uh, had a, a great deal of difficulty experiencing anger. Did, did I tell you the story? And um, so we were trying to get something going there. And I noticed that there was, so this is a person who is very flat, unemotional, like nothing really happening. And I noticed that there was some tension coming in, that there was some feeling that was seeming to emerge there. And then it just, we lost it just like that. And I said, well, what just happened here? And uh, he, he said, well, I just noticed that I was getting uncomfortable. And I just focused on my breath. Well, where'd you learn to do that? Well, just through my meditation, whatever. Oh, so does that help us get closer to this feeling that we're trying to connect with? Or does that, you know, uh, avoid or, or move away from that? Well, the, it was the latter of the two, right? So, um, so we want to be careful with some of that. Just some, I guess, some existential questions or musings, some things that we can, we can think about. Um, there's something called Nietzsche's wager the idea of, of eternal return. So he encourages us to engage in a thought experiment where there's an angel or a demon, depending on you know, your take on this thought experiment, who comes to you and, and says, you know, uh, at the end of your life, look, um, I'm going to give you a gift. And, and that gift is that you get to live again. But there are conditions to this gift. You get to live the exact same life in the exact same way without being able to do anything different, you experience all the wonderful things that you've experienced in your life again, as, lo as well as all the hardships, all the struggle, all the suffering, you'll have to endure that all again. And he invites us to, to think about, would we see that as a gift or would we see that as you know, a, a nightmare uh, effectively? And so what he says is, is that you should live your life in a way that you would be w willing to live each moment again for an eternity, you know? And not to live your life in, in a way that, uh, that that would be, I, I don't know, like a, a nightmare to you. You think about like deathbed reflections, like if you imagine like, okay, well, and again, this is just to get in tune with some of these, these existential issues and, and how they might bear on, on your life. If you were to imagine like, you know, living to a healthy age of, I don't know, like 80 something and, and you know, you're, you're on your deathbed, thinking about like looking back on your life and, and would you be content with what you've done? You know, would you have any regrets? You know, are there things that you would want to change? Um, you know, if you were to die, like what would people say about you? You know, how would they characterize your life? What would you want them to say? How would you want them to, to think about you? Um, these are questions worth, worth considering. Um, there was, uh, I remember, yeah, I mean, there, there was one guy that I was working with and very kind of detached and floaty in, in his way of being or, or something. And uh, we're talking about uh, just how much he, how much many video games he was playing, just like he was clearly addicted to video games and playing just hours and hours and hours, um, addicted to marijuana as well, just getting high all the time. And we were talking about trying to get something going, like, well, what, what do you want out of this life? What matters to you? What is meaningful to you? And we were kind of toying with the, this sort of deathbed confession type stuff. Well, what, you know, what would your eulogy be? You know, what would people say about you? I mean, would, would they say, you know, scored, you know, this, this you know, score on, on whatever game or, um, or that he, you know, he smoked a lot of pot? You know, the, how does that sound to you? How does that sit with you? What, do you have any feeling about that? Are you, are you comfortable with that? Are you content with that? Um, yeah. And for some people, uh, strangely enough, I, I do find it very strange. Some people are content with that. You know, which is really, uh, really interesting. Um, yeah, I remember one person I was working with, and I, I said, "Well, you know, 
I, I can't remember how we got there, but we got to this question of, of like, well, why, why do you continue to live? Like, why, if life is so meaningless and devoid of, of anything worth doing, like, why, you know, why, why are you here? Why, you know, are you choosing life? Like, and I remember his answer was, was something along the lines of, uh, well, um, you know, there's, there's so many new developments in, in uh, games and whatnot, and I'm just really excited for, for VR, virtual reality. And I just, you know, I, I guess I just can't wait to see what, what's going to come out next. And, you know, like, wow, like that says so much, you know? Like looking forward to, you know, looking forward to a virtual reality, a virtual space, you know? Um, and again, arguably caught up in, in this sort of fallen mode of being as a kind of curiosity um, and, uh, and a stimulation without any sort of authentic choice. Yeah? Well, it, 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 it actually reveals something. It reveals something about the, the way that this person is, I think, in, in the world. Um, I mean, it's not for me to say like, well, that's, that's not a life worth living or something like that. I, that's not for me to say that. Um, but uh, where would I go with that? I, would, I, would, I mean, usually you just link it back into the concerns that the person has, right? And they do usually link in in some way, you know? So a person is coming in because, well, yeah, I, sure, I, I love playing video games and being detached and whatever, but, you know, I, I get these panic attacks, you know, that are a real problem. Actually, that's part of the reason why I smoke as much weed as I do to try to manage them, you know? Well, do you think these things could be related in some way? I mean, they usually are, you know? Um, we can think of nihilism as maybe like a comfortable avoidance and or a, a disburdening of responsibility, a responsibility to, to oneself, arguably, um, and maybe to other people as well. Um, you know, so to, to think that the world is, you know, devoid of meaning, that nothing matters, that nothing's worth doing in this sort of laissez-faire kind of uh, way is, uh, I mean, arguably it's, it's a betraying of, of a future version of yourself, you know? It's living in the immediacy of, of the now, the comfortable distractions, you know, the living perhaps according to Freud's pleasure principle, just doing whatever, you know, kind of is stimulating in a given moment but at the cost of, again, you know, betraying some future version of, of who, who you might want to be. I, I find it fascinating, like, the, the more you learn about history and previous generations and the absolute horrors that people had to endure and overcome and just how good we have it now, you know? And then we ask the question, well, what are we doing with the freedoms that we have? What are we making of the lives that that we're fortunate to, to have. Um, I think in many ways we, we could uh, be doing a lot more. Um, I don't know what, uh, I, I just wanted to point this out. I, I don't really have anything like uh, mind blowing to say about it, but there's a kind of um, a parallel here between angst and boredom. So angst is, again, that, that sort of existential um, anxiety in being thrown out of the world and seeing the world in its worldhood. Boredom, like a profound boredom, has a similar kind of effect. Like it disrupts your, your, your everyday way of just going about your business and engaging with entities and people and conversations and so on. Like in profound boredom, like there's nothing in the world that grabs hold of your attention. There's nothing that solicits you to engage in any meaningful way. The world shows up, but you don't find anything worth engaging with it. And, but the quality of boredom is such that like, you just want to turn away and, and find something else, but that something else never shows up. You know? It doesn't have the same level of anxiety as, as angst. And one way that I might kind of characterize it is, is that um, in angst, it's like the world reveals itself and it's pulling away from you. And, and you're trying to get some footing, you know, and there's like this electric kind of anxiety uh, in that. In boredom, it's like the world is there, but it, it's more that it reveals something about you, about, you know, your way of existing in this world. So it, 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 I think boredom may reveal a covering over of something relevant within yourself, a hiding of something. 
um, uh, maybe even you know, uh, opening up to genuine possibilities that, that could be actualized uh, through your efforts. Where do we derive meaning? Like, what, what, can we, what can we do to attain a sense of meaning? Well, again, we can, you know, we can't find it through some doctrine, arguably, right? At least not in an absolute sense. And much of the time, what is meaningful is how we comport ourselves, like through our actions, how we, you know, again, if, if we find some value that is lacking in some way, um, something of our existential condition that is unsettling and, and we want to address it in some way, well then create something, you know, uh, press into the unknown, into the chaos of, of the world and, and create something that will, that will symbolize that, that value or that, that part of, of the human experience that you want to, to draw out and attend to in a way that maybe resonates with other people. That, you, we can find meaning in that. The act of love and you know, uh, I'm borrowing from Viktor Frankl here, that for him, love is, is in a way seeing another person in their dormant potentialities, right? In, in not, not necessarily who they are today, but, but who they might be, who, what they're capable of becoming. To, to really love someone is to see them in you know, I guess as, as uh, not as an object, not as a thing, as, as, a, as a fellow human being, you know, and, uh, and it's, uh, it frees you up as well, you know, like when you see someone who is like really cynical and, and dismissing and angry and, and so on, like just imagine like what, who this person really is. That's not who they really are. This is just how they, they seem to operate in the world. Who they are is hidden. If you imagine who they genuinely are, you might have that impulse to just want to give this person a hug, you know? Now maybe that's what they really need, you know, someone to connect with them in that way. Um, and we'll get into this one next time. It kind of links up a little bit more with the uh, freedom and responsibility thing, but, uh, but that we can find meaning in our, our suffering, that the attitude that we take to uh, the, the hardships that we endure, uh, that there can be a, a kind of uh, meaning in, in that as well. Okay. And thinking about everything uh, conceptually, I guess, and, and right. doing this type of thing. Well, yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't know what to say. Like, I mean, certainly, like, we are, and Heidegger was very concerned about this, about um, uh, where civilization was taking us uh, with technology and swimming in, in this sea of um, superficiality and distractions and um, creature comforts and, and so on, you know, that, that there's like a, a deadening of, of the human spirit or, or something, you know, in that. Um, and again, not being able to discern like what, what is authentically meaningful, you know, whatever that might mean and, and what is just, you know, again, just pointless distraction. Um, I think part of it is, is that we're just too comfortable, I, I think, in many ways. Um, that, uh, you know, like, I, I, occasionally I, I meet with people who come from other parts of the world that are just war-torn, just absolute horrors that, that they had experienced and endured. And, and you know, it, it's just mind-blowing in, in some ways. Like, that they were able to overcome as, as much as they have and that they're trying to make a go of things here and, you know, and, and not giving up and, and the spirit that they have to just keep pushing ahead and, and doing good things and helping others and so on. Like, I think it would be good for us to, um, and I think it's maybe something that's worth practicing, like make yourself uncomfortable, you know, do something really difficult, um, you know, see what you're made of, you know, that, that sort of thing. Like even just as something as silly as, as just like uh, every morning, you know, take a cold shower, you know, know what it is to just be like really uncomfortable and, and um, uh, you know, not, not take some of these, these everyday distractions, I, I guess, and creature comforts for granted. Um, but we'll wrap up there maybe for today. See you guys back here on Thursday. <laughs>